I learned during my research for the book that only 10% of people who perceive alcohol to be a problem for them will actually seek help or, or even do anything about it. That means that for every one person who's in a 12 step program, there are 10 more people who could be if they were just going to, if they could just say, Hey, I don't really think I've got a handle on this. All right, my friends, I am so excited to welcome Ruby Warrington to the Sober Stories podcast. Ruby, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I assume most of the people listening to this podcast are very familiar with you and your work, but for those who may not know who you are or what you do, can you give us kind of the high notes of who you are, who you are, who you do life with, what you do? Sure. So I'm British. I've been based in the US for 10 years now. Um, I'm here today with my cat, Larry, <laughs> literally almost on my laptop. So you might get to see him in a moment. I live with my husband, Simon. Um, and I'm, I guess, first and foremost, a journalist, mm. although I've transitioned out of that kind of career path over the past five, six years into authoring books okay. and also working as a book coach, like a manuscript coach mm. and what I call book, book doula. I help people birth their books <laughs> at whatever stage in the process they might be with that. Um, and I guess, you know, the reason that I'm here talking to you today is because I coined the term sober curious about six years ago mm. now um, at a time in my life when I was um, reevaluating my relationship with alcohol. And mm. like you shared before we started recording, looking around at the sort of sober space and not necessarily seeing my entry point, mm. um, but also knowing that there was something for me to look at in yeah. terms of how I was consuming alcohol, why I was consuming alcohol, et cetera, et cetera. And then Sober Curious became a book, which came out at the very end of 2018 um, and has really been part, I suppose, of this um, unfolding, mm. sweeping global new sobriety movement. Mm. Um, so I found myself <laughs> kind of unexpectedly part of this movement, which I don't know, if you'd have told me 10 years ago totally. that I would be having this conversation with you and that I would be credited with kind of you know, being part and parcel of helping the world reevaluate our relationship to alcohol. I never would have believed you because, um, yeah, I, I had a very different relationship to alcohol 10 years ago. Well, I was beginning to get sober curious 10 years ago, let's say. Um, it was definitely in my consciousness as yeah. something to be addressed, but I was at the very beginning of that journey. Mm. First off, I love a cat named with a human name. Like that's like my favorite. <laughs> I love like a Joe or like a Doug. That's, that's yeah. an animal. Um, uh -huh. But you know, there's so much I'm really excited to dive in with you about because this is such a rapidly changing landscape. There have been so many changes in the last couple of years, and there's so many other ways of doing this and of accessing this, you know, what we can consider kind of a lifestyle change for a lot of people. And it's so important. The presenting partner of Sober Stories is Liars Non-Alcoholic Spirits. That's Liars as an L-Y-R-E, like the Australian liar bird, which can mimic just about any sound. Like that fancy Aussie bird, Liars was created to replicate and replicate well as many different alcoholic spirits as possible, allowing us to drink our way. Now that the sun is shining and the birds are chirping, plan ahead for your next spring barbecue by packing a cooler of spectacularly crafted non-alcoholic cocktails to have in hand when they ask Ask you what you'd like to drink. Liars has your sunshine days covered with their pre-mixed beverage line. They're easy, festive, and made for the season. With five different opportunities for celebration, the Classico's our favorite, Liars canned selections are the Sober Stories team's go-to for fresh alcoholic-free sips. Head over to Liars.com and use code SOBERSTORIES1010, that's the number 10, the word 10, for 10% 10 off your purchase. Liars gives you the freedom to drink your way, to not just provide an alternative to those who don't wish to imbibe alcohol, but to ensure that everyone can enjoy the mirth and the merriment of a soiree or shindig. What you and I were talking about before we started is that when I quit drinking four and a half years ago, it felt like nobody was talking about this. There wasn't really this lexicon yet. I wasn't really, it was, it was like mid-2017, so I'm sure you were out there in the space talking about this, but I hadn't found it yet. And there's a whole no whole new vocabulary that we're using, a whole new approach to this that is really giving people a lot more access to change. Mm -hmm. So I would love to start 10 years ago. Um, 
and kind of dig into your relationship with alcohol and how that evolved over time and how you discovered your sober curiosity and where you are today. So 10 years ago, I had just moved to New York from London. I had already had sort of 15 years, fairly successful career as a journalist in London. The media industry in the UK, um, particularly through the turn of the millennium and like the, the, throughout the noughties and kind of into the first, second decade of the millennium was a very, very hedonistic, mm. alcohol saturated space. But then I feel like the whole world was mm -hmm. at that point. It was kind of like the Sex and the City years. There was just a, a real kind of, um, it was a time when heavy drinking was seen as being very glamorous. Mm. And my career was kind of like at the heart of that and was responsible, like the magazines and titles that I worked for are very much responsible for kind of propagating that idea as mm. well. And so I was just kind of living that life like I didn't really start drinking until my early 20s like after college um was kind of and that was when I that coincided with me kind of entering into this this media scene sure. in London and I quickly developed a pretty high tolerance for alcohol but I also you know I was I was a, a, a fun times drinker mm -hmm. if I was ever stressed out or anxious or going through a difficult time I didn't want to drink I actually, that was my trigger to like take a step back and kind of make sure I got enough sleep and kind of look after myself. Mm. I was the kind of drinker who would drink more to have more fun, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, alcohol hadn't ever brought me any more serious problems than some pretty hardcore hangovers. There had been mm. pretty hardcore hangovers, but, you know, I'd never gotten in serious trouble through my drinking. And when I moved to the, to the US, it was really, I guess, my opportunity to like live the sex in the city dream. Mm. Like I literally, yeah. I guess like, I guess like so many people, women particularly coming to New York in our twenties, thirties, there is just this kind of allure of mm. like this cocktail culture. The Carrie Bradshaw. And I think like. being in a, but right. Exactly. I think being in a new city that is a very social city, um, being trying to wanting to make new friends, being introduced to a lot of other Brits, and people listening probably do know that the Brits have quite a reputation for being quite a sure. drinking culture and a binge drinking culture as well. Um, I think there was there was that side, but then this is this is the year, two thousand twelve. Although I'd already start had the first tinges of, mm, do I really need these hangovers? Mm. Mm. Is this a, am I taking things a bit too far? Those twinges had been there, 2011. But 2012, when I moved to New York, there was this very kind of like seductive, glamorous nightlife that felt like it was going to be how I would meet people, mm. and how I would establish myself in the city, how I'd find my place in the city. And it coincided with me going freelance for the first time. I worked for quite a prestigious newspaper in the UK, having that kind of status and prestige kind of taken away from me, mm. leaving behind all my friends and family and really kind of feeling a bit lost, mm. but like super glamorous lost. <laughs> and I think that combination was actually what tipped my drinking from kind of dial up the fun to, I need this to help me feel more secure. I need mm. this to boost and bolster my identity and I do actually believe that it was that that shift that tipped it more into the kind of problem drinking territory. Mm -hmm. Not that I hadn't already been aware that I was possibly drinking more than was good for me, mm -hmm. but I hadn't. But I think it was that it was that year that I had some of my my most intense, prolonged, and painful. When I say painful, just you know, long horrific hangovers, mm -hmm. um, binge drinking episodes. It was the first year, first and only time I've drink, drunk and drove was that summer. Mm. Um, I actually took a magazine job in Ibiza as well, which was mm. crazy. So I was commuting between New York and Ibiza, which again, on the, on the surface, sounds so glamorous, right? Yeah. So cool. And at the same time, it was exhausting and yeah. so stressful. And I was constantly worn out and I just felt completely, I just felt really lost. Um, and so, yeah, that was the summer when it kind of tipped into – maybe I really should get serious mm. about taking a break, at least taking a break, or at least just kind of like looking at some of those questions that had already begun to tap me on the shoulder 
is drinking really serving me? Am I drinking too much? What is too much? If I did stop, what would it mean? Like, do I have a problem? Mm -hmm. These sorts of questions. And that questioning, which I think, I bet if you got the vast majority of quote unquote normal social drinkers alone in a room and granted them complete anonymity (laughs) and asked if they'd ever asked themselves these questions, the majority of people would say yes, Mm -hmm. right? Um, That's something I've kind of discovered over the past 10 years, being really kind of proactive in this sober curious space. But yeah, I, um, at the time, my answer to the question, like, okay, do I need to quit drinking was, okay, do I need to go to AA? And that just felt very extreme. And it didn't necessarily match up with the kind of drinking that I was doing, Mm -hmm. even though there had been some pretty negative consequences by this point, just in terms of feeling really terrible. Um, But that was the summer when I started to, yeah, take some breaks, get a bit more serious about what would this What would it actually look like to quit? What would it mean? What would it mean about me? What would it mean about my relationships, Mm. my social life? Like, would it be hard? Like all of this sort of stuff. And so that's when I started to really get sober curious. Um, But it was like, I think 2013, I did my first ever dry January and failed. (laughs) As many of us do. (laughs) I think think failing at dry January, it was like, whoa, I made it to like, you know, the 26th or 27th of January. And then a friend visited from the UK and we went out and I had drinks and I was just like, oh, wow, I can't actually do a month without drinking. That's maybe there, maybe there is, maybe I do need to Mm -hmm. like really get serious about this. Um, it, It took me until 2015 to actually go to an AA meeting. I asked a friend who's in the program to take me to a couple of meetings. Um, And yeah, my hunch that I wasn't, it didn't really feel like it was my place proved right. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people feel like that when they go to AA and, you know, it it absolutely is the right place for a lot of people. And who knows, maybe if I'd have been in a different headspace or maybe if, maybe if that drink driving incident Mm. had ended in something, ended in a DUI, it would have been like, right. I sometimes feel like the difference between am I a candidate for AA or not is very, very Thin fine line. line. Yeah. And so, but I just didn't really, when I, you know, it's the classic thing of listening to everybody's stories. I was like, no, this isn't, I haven't experienced any of this. Mm. I didn't feel like it fit. And it took another year then for me to, ho- I, I hosted a sober curious event mm. basically. <laughs> Because I had, by that point, started having conversations among my friend group, just like I was kind of mentioning earlier, you know, just being kind of open with people with where I was at, asking where they were at. And I realized that a lot more people than you would think to kind of look at with the naked eye also had a lot of these same questions going around their minds. Mm. And I just thought, wouldn't it be great if we had a space where we could actually just talk about this? Like mm. no judgment, no shame. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean you're an alcoholic. It doesn't mean you have to quit. But like, what if we just asked the questions out loud mm. and shared our experiences? So I hosted an event and like 80 people showed up. Wow. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so there's something here. Um, so that was February 20, m- March yeah, it was around like spring 2016. Um, and I went on, continued to host those events through the end of 2018, just before my first book came out. Mm. So that's kind of, that's, that's pretty much the story. <laughs> well, so tell me before we, there, I have, I have a lot of notes. I have a lot of questions, but okay. how did your own drinking evolve as you are discovering all of these other people who are asking the same questions for you? Was it something that kind of naturally changed on its own or where are you at today? Like, what do you consider yourself today? Today, I consider myself a Mm -hmm. non-drinker, meaning that I don't think of alcohol as part of my lifestyle. Mm -hmm. It's not something I think about. I never order a drink. That said, I don't feel comfortable. And I do describe myself as sober because it's shorthand for that. But at the same time, um, I'm not ruling out the fact that I might have a glass of champagne at a mm. wedding or, a, you know, like yeah. it's kind of on a case by case basis for mm. me. It's just that uh, over the past like 10 years through answering honestly with integrity, 
and thoroughly all of my own sober curious questions, Hmm. I have discovered that for me, an appropriate drinking occasion comes up like maybe once a year Mm. or every two years. Mm -hmm. And the drink will be like one drink or like three quarters of a drink Mm -hmm. because that's pretty much all I can have now without Mm. starting to feel some negative effects. And honestly, like at this point, I don't know if I will pick up a drink again Mm -hmm. because it just doesn't feel good in my body. Like it Mm. never has the same effect that it used to. It never has really the desired effect. That's not actually, that's not true. There was one occasion in the summer of 2020 and we all know how tense things were that summer. And um, I just got to a point where I really was so, just there was just so much anxiety and my body just, I felt like every muscle was just kind of cramping with tension. Mm. And I thought I want, I just started thinking about having a glass of wine and I had like half a glass, three quarters of a glass of wine and it did sort of give that kind of Mm. out breath Mm -hmm. sensation but I knew I didn't want any more Mm. I knew I didn't want to get out of it so it kind of weirdly felt sort of medicinal in Mm. that instance but that's a pretty extreme scenario (laughs) like the middle of a pandemic and a social justice uprising living in New York City I mean that's quite extreme like that kind of a drinking occasion isn't going to come around that often, sure. hopefully. Gosh, I know. If we could so all just to just... kind of give you an example of like, you know, the, the kind of time when I would, like, so that was what, two, almost two years ago? Mm-hmm. Two years ago at this point. So, well, and the reason, so, yeah. the reason I asked is I, I'm kind of a geek for a language. And when you talk about how AA wasn't a fit, I believe very firmly that there are many boxes for us to fit in. And we, for a very long time, only had conversations around drinking or not drinking with one box and one type of identity or path forward to evaluate your relationship with alcohol. And for so many of us, that's just not a box we fit in. And Mm -hmm. I think that there's a big disconnect between the boxes that we are presented versus the ones that we actually thrive within. And for so many people, it's a barrier to entry. If they don't see themselves fitting in sort of this one identity and they don't realize that there are other ways of being, of, of examining their relationship with alcohol, of changing it. I think it's, it's, it's an access issue for folks if they don't realize. So that's why, that's why I love asking like what your specific framing is, because it's different than the last person we had on the podcast. It's going to be different than the next. And I think that that's a really rich, valuable experience to have such varied experiences. One of the things Mm -hmm. I I wrote down all of the questions you asked of like, am I drinking too much? Do I have a drinking problem? And I think you're so right about this idea that so many more people are asking these questions internally than we realize. And I work with women who are changing their relationship with alcohol and they'll say, you know, it just looks like everyone else is having so much fun. I'm like, you really don't know what their internal experience is with this because Mm -hmm. think of all of the other people who you see suddenly talk about changing their relationship with alcohol or quitting drinking. You're like, I never would have guessed that that person has X, Y, Z experience. So when you started listening to these twinges, these like little heart tugs that said, maybe this isn't working for me. What did that experience look like, like within your social scene, within your relationships? How did that change how you showed up in the world when you started to listen to those heart tugs? First of all, I will respond to that. First of all, I just want to touch base on something you said about the barrier to entry. Mm. I feel so strongly that the whole point for me of this sober curious movement is about giving people permission Mm -hmm. to ask the question. Yeah. And that to me, I know many people who've got sober curious and found their way to a more robust treatment program. Right. Right. (laughs) I've almost, I kind of believe like every, everyone who's in AA was sober curious Mm -hmm. at one point. Right. (laughs) Before we ever had the language for so, it. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. It's all about it's all about access. I, I learned during my research for the book that only 10% of people who perceive alcohol to be a problem for them will mm. actually seek help mm-hmm. or, or even do anything about it. Mm. That means that for every one person who's in a 12-step program, there are 10 more people mm. who could be mm. if they were just going to – if they could just say, hey, I don't really think I've got a handle on this. Yeah. 
you know? And yeah. so I really, a huge part of my mission, if I have a mission, I mean, really, this has just been about doing, doing work, creating something that I needed, I mm. suppose, is about giving people permission to actually just kind of like ask the question without shame, without stigma, without judgment, mm. just like because we're human beings and this is a highly addictive substance and it's everywhere. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. the math suggests that many of us are going to run up to with some problems, right? Mm. Um, so in terms of when I first started cutting back, I mean, you know, the classic response was, but you don't have a problem. Mm. If I would be like, I'm not drinking tonight. Why not? Yeah. Like, but you don't have a problem. My response now would be, well, def- can we define problem? Because, yes. you know, that's completely subjective. Right. <laughs> Again, to your point, like you have no idea. You've no, you haven't seen me in the grips of my 3 a.m. panic attack, mm. <laughs> you know, um, after a night drinking or, and that point about like, Everybody else looks like they're having so much fun. Why am I not having the same? Well, you don't, you know, they're not posting on social media the next morning. You know, you're not, you're not with them the next morning experiencing the after effects of that fun. You know, you also don't know what necessarily, you don't necessarily know what happened an hour before they came out that they might desperately be trying to escape from, right. squish down, like whatever it is. So yeah, that's the, uh, Alcohol has got a very, very good PR team <laughs> working on its behalf. Anyway, um, but yeah, typically I get that response, but you don't have a problem. And this is what I mean, because I was never the blackout drunk. I was yeah. never the pass out drunk. I was never the get in trouble, lose my keys, get locked out, can't get home, like mm-hmm. wake up in the middle of the night. Like, that was just not my experience, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, people would often say to me, you didn't even seem drunk last night. Hmm. And it's, I guess it's... <laughs> That, and it's so arbitrary, right? right? The way that we, the way that that our drunkenness looks on the mm. outside, um, and the it, goalpost moves. It impacts too. all of us differently, right? And that's what I mean about define problem. My problem didn't look like the classic things we associate with a drinking problem. My problem looked like obsessive thinking about drinking, mm. chronic anxiety, and depression, and sadness, and frustration, feeling completely stuck in my life. Mm. You know, like I said, just terrible hangovers working out my schedule for the week in terms of work and socializing based on how hungover I would be Mm -hmm. at various points during the week. You know, these kinds of things, which they're not life-threatening, but they're hugely quality of life threatening, (laughs) which I think is worth, is worth like taking a stand for, you know? Right. If you've been here for a while, you know that mommy wine culture has been a huge part of my personal story with alcohol. This appealing camaraderie, this rosé all day aesthetic that so many people find themselves falling into. I'm passionate about combating this message that harms so many people. And that's one of the reasons I really appreciate what the team at Dispa is doing. One of the reasons they crafted this delicious line of non-alcoholic sparkling aperitifs is because of Katy Perry's experience as a busy mom. She knew she wanted something bubbly, a celebratory nightcap, but she didn't want it to get in the way of early mornings and long nights. In her words, Dessois aperitifs allow her to be the brightest and most dynamic self. And I think it doesn't hurt that the ashwagandha and reishi mushrooms they use have that lovely calming effect. Try it yourself with code Sober Stories and save 15% off your first purchase at drinkdessois.com. That's D-R-I-N-K. D-E-S-O-I dot com. When I think about this question, do I have a drinking problem? I know the majority of the people listening to this podcast will have Googled that at one point or another because it's a very human Google search to, to make. And for so long, the conversation around this with just having two options, AA or not, has always been like, you can find something that'll tell you if you have a drinking problem, yes or no, one way or the other. But now we're starting to have different conversations about it. We're starting to say, maybe you don't meet this diagnostic criteria, but is this just not working for you? Or is this Mm -hmm. something that's starting to impact your self-worth or your inner dialogue? But I want to touch on alcohol's PR team. And get your take on this idea (laughs) of alcohol in the media and what you have seen over time, especially being a media person, about this conversation, about the way we talk about alcohol, how glamorous it is, what we use it for. Do you see any sort of change happening or are we still kind of doing what we were doing in 2012? I mean, obviously I mentioned Sex in the City. I feel like that show glamorized alcohol. But I don't remember alcohol being as ubiquitous in the media Mm. as it back then, as it is now. Mm. I think if anything, 
we've witnessed alcohol go from being this glamorous party, good time substance to just everywhere mm. all the time. I don't know if you watched that show. Oh, is it called In Love? That HBO show, mm -hmm. HBO show. Oh, Love Life <laughs> with Anna Kendrick, the first series anyway. But um, I was watching that recently and I was like, literally every single scene mm. they're drinking, mm. regardless of the occasion, you know? And actually there is one character, there's one character who's, who has to go to rehab. And yet everybody else in the show is drinking as much as her. <laughs> of course. And it's kind of like, how come all of their drinking is okay? But this right. one unlucky girl, right. because she's got a few more kind of like traumatic things going right. on and she cries a bit more, mm. has to go to rehab mm -hmm. and has a problem. You know, it's just kind of, I, I, re I really, and I don't know if this is because I don't drink anymore, but I, I'm sure many people will relate to this, but and, and you too probably, but it really does just feel like alcohol is ever present mm. in media meaning tv you know tv movies whatever um social media even um yeah it just it's gone i think from being this glamorous special occasion thing to being an all day every day mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. maybe it was always that way and i just didn't notice yeah. but i don't know what you think what do you think you know i i see it both ways i see there being more conversations about things like the work you do. And I, sometimes I see younger people like Gen Z and I'm like, I think they're doing this differently and they're talking about this differently. But then, you know, I see some study that says college binge drinking is as bad as it ever was. So I just don't know. I feel like in some ways we're starting to think about this differently, but it also might just be the echo chamber that you and I live in yeah. and, and yeah. existed. It's interesting. Like, so there's that other show. I'm single drunk female which i think mm -hmm. is on hulu mm -hmm. it's a really great i love it it's so sweet like it's really well written but again it's focusing on oh this has person has a problem and yeah. then all her friends drink tons right. and it's like what about everybody else's right. drinking right. you know right. just because she ended up getting like drink being drunk at work one day mm -hmm. and okay sure maybe that is a shade so that's that's maybe the kind of drinking that we might say okay this is a problem this person needs treatment right But what about all the other heavy, heavy mm. social drinking that happens mm. that we still don't see as a problem? I do think there's a bigger conversation about sobriety, like Wired Magazine did a big piece this weekend on like the end of alcohol and stuff. Hmm. I'll have to look that one up. I'm watching. But I still, but I still, but I still do think there's, that there's still a long way to go yeah. in terms of breaking down that binary. Mm. You're either a, a problem drinker or a normal right. drinker. I'm watching The Flight Attendant on HBO right now. And the main right. character is an alcoholic. And on one hand, the way they portray her inner dialogue and the characters in her head that are the devil and the angel on her shoulders, I'm like, this is the most accurate portrayal. Because I, I, I come from the addiction standpoint. I'm like, wow, this is like somebody came from my brain, plucked out the thoughts in my brain. But at the same time, it, it's the same thing. She has very severe consequences in her life. And it's interesting to think about what if we started portraying people who, I guess it's just not as, as exciting of a story, but this idea of somebody who gets off before there's ever exactly. this negative consequence, before there's ever the DUI or in Cassie's case, the flight attendant, like Russian spies and stuff. But, you know, we <laughs> it's a great show, by the way. I do I do recommend it. But It's it's interesting to start thinking about. I, I interviewed a, a gal a couple of weeks ago, Jordan Granger. She's 23. She's a TikTok famous now because of a TikTok she posted about being sober curious, and now she mm. identifies as sober curious. You might actually, maybe I'll have connected at some point in time. Mm. Um, but it, it's I feel like we're starting to see these people who are realizing. And, and what Jordan said, she said. Oh, I, I don't think I'm any better than anybody who's ever experienced addic addiction because I know I was on that path. I was headed that direction. And if I had kept drinking, I would have gotten there eventually. And, and it just makes me wonder, like, if we started having more conversations about that versus these horrible consequences that eventually happens when somebody's had prolonged challenges with alcohol use. I mean, it's interesting. I, I wonder who their well, PR yeah. agent is and who's getting them all this good coverage. 
<laughs> totally. Well, I think I remember I heard the term early exeter, mm -hmm. which I think kind of describes it. And yeah, there's not a lot of drama in that. There's not a lot yeah. of good, like, there's not, it doesn't make great TV. No. <laughs> you know, that kind of like subtle no. inner dialogue of, I think I'm going to pull back now before it gets any worse. No, yeah. you know, yeah. that's okay. That's, that's okay. okay. Yeah. And I do think that the, the more conversations there are around, well, no, I, I think it's a double-edged sword because I think the more we focus on stories about extreme alcoholism or like extremely negative consequences, the more there is people, for people to compare their relatively mild right. consequences with and say, well, I'm not that bad. Right. And I know I did a ton of that. I don't drink as much as them. I don't drink every night. Yeah. Like I'd never drink that kind of a drink. Do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. I had, I used to do that so much mm -hmm. and just justify my own drinking, the level of my own drinking, mm -hmm. you know? I really like the term that you've coined, this idea of curiosity. I think that curiosity is such a skill and such a benefit for us to take into all sorts of areas of our life. And then, and I like that it has this idea of thoughtfulness without judgment or thoughtfulness without an expected outcome. So how mm. did you come up with this idea of sober curiosity? Where did this come from? Well, I was hosting the first event and I really wanted to find something to say, talk about who it was for, you know? And um, so as I said, I'm a journalist and kind of a wordsmith by trade. Like when I worked in magazines, I was always the one the editor would call over and get to like, what should be the cover line mm. for this story or what should be the headline for this story? So it's kind of something I've been practiced at. But I was really thinking about um, what other areas of life we allow for some shades of gray and for there to be more of a spectrum. Mm. And I thought about sexuality and mm -hmm. it sounds kind of antiquated now, but this term bi-curious yep. used to be used to describe people who were kind of like experimenting with their sexuality um, who weren't necessarily putting a label on it right. or uh, I'm this or an I'm that or it, this is how I am forever or whatever. And it just felt like, oh yeah, so mm. curious. It's the same kind of experimental, playful, empowered, empowering, yeah. autonomous kind of path. Like non-judgmental, no labels, like that's really the vibe that I wanted mm. to create. Again, just to give per people permission to ask what are these very normal, natural questions to be having, mm. but which have become so tinged with fear and stigma and right. shame right. because we have so much fear and stigma and shame around addiction, the subject of mm -hmm. addiction in general. And like the wider, wider mission of Sober Curious, I suppose is to help to destigmatize right. the conversation around addiction because our brains are wired for addiction. Like right. addiction is normative human behavior. Mm. And yet we have so much stigma around addiction. There's so much um, just shame, blame, you know, negative connotations around right. what it means about a person's personality and all this stuff, which is just completely meaning. Mm. It's not meaningless because obviously it's very damaging, but um has very little to do with people's actual experiences of mm. addictive behaviors, mm. you know? Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that creating a term that was as expansive and non-judgmental as possible mm. was really important because I didn't want people to feel afraid yeah. to ask these questions, knowing that once we can actually start to have honest conversations, hmm. we can maybe stop, stop a runaway train in its tracks and mm. actually be like, no, you know what? <laughs> this isn't this isn't serving me. Right. So maybe now is the time to get off. Right. Yeah, I completely agree. You know, when I was doing the research for this episode, I noticed you're an INFJ on the Myers Briggs. Yes. <laughs> and I have talked to so many sober, sober curious INFJs recently, which is very odd because it's the least yeah. common type. I'm also an INFJ. And wow. I'm like starting to put together this like string theory of INFJs, like highly sensitive, introverted people who are suddenly experiencing challenges with substance use. But is is that like, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that there's any correlation with that? <laughs> Definitely. I think maybe INFJs aren't as uncommon as um, we've been led to believe. Mm. And we're just, I don't know, having more of a voice now or something. Yeah. Um, I kind of feel like 
I definitely identify as highly sensitive. And I absolutely think that that's one of the reasons why alcohol was so appealing mm. to me. Alcohol desensitizes. It's an anesthetic. I mean, yes. it desensitizes mm. us. Like it's very overwhelming for me to be in large groups of people. And mm. so, of course, I found alcohol and leaned on alcohol heavily as a way to socialize because mm -hmm. I thought socializing meant being around large groups of people. Right. As a non-drinker, I realized that socializing for me is best when it's just me and one other person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's about what I can hand. That's what mm -hmm. about what my kind of my empathetic sort of sensory receptors can handle is mm -hmm. like one other person, you know? Yeah. Small, you know. Other, large groups in small doses for small periods of time. Right. Um, so that there's a definite correlation. I think that a lot of people and of course extroverts have different kinds of reasons right. that they use alcohol but like I think that introverts are more sensitive types like alcohol is a very useful substance mm -hmm. in helping us feel and act more extroverted mm. in a world that celebrates and is largely set up for extroverts right, right. I, I think it's Amanda Kuda who said that something a lot this is paraphrasing but a lot of people who believe that they are extroverts realized when they quit drinking that they were just actually introverts who were using this substance to push through. And I had this conversation with a client of mine this morning of coming to terms with the fact that actually I would rather just have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody than to mm. be in a room full of 20 people and performing. And mm. as you said, that is not really what our society is set up for or what is expected of us in understanding their personality types for a reason. The person I was talking to this morning was an INFJ. So right. <laughs> their personality types for a reason and yeah. really trusting ourselves to know that this is what feels good and that we have the permission to stick to what feels good and not push ourselves past our boundaries. And I think one of the, mm. the biggest lessons I've learned in being sober is like, I get to decide now what actually feels good for me. I don't have to push through or I don't have to numb myself down or get, you know, this, this kind of, um, stimulant feeling from alcohol to, to make it through. I get to just decide that maybe I don't want to do that thing, or maybe that doesn't sound fun mm -hmm. to me. And I'm going to do this other thing and that that's okay. I feel like just that permission. And, and one of the words I hear you, you say often is this idea of permission. We have permission mm. to show up in a world, in the world, in a way that serves us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Exactly. It's very interesting. I've really noticed how in having removed alcohol and obviously just being so much more aware of my emotional responses in any given moment, just how much guilt I feel hmm. about doing the things that I want to do. Hmm. And I feel like that was another reason I used alcohol. Like, yeah. Like you said, you know, using alcohol to kind of like push through or like fit in or show up in certain ways and then realizing how much guilt I feel for like mm. not being that person that kind of is expected of me or that other people would prefer me to be. Mm. That's wild. And there's a lot to dig into about like what's underneath that feeling of guilt about having what I want and doing what I need and putting my needs first, you know? Mm. Do you so still, I think that's, do you feel that's like you, a really interesting thing. Do you feel like you still experience that? Yeah, in bits and pieces. Mm. Yeah, depending on the scenario, not so much. Not so much. I've got better at giving myself permission. And I think part of it is kind of just really, you know, it's interesting, this conversation about ambi uh, extroverts and introverts. I kind of feel like we're all on a spectrum with that as well, yeah, right? Totally. We're all sort of ambiverts and like in certain situations and on certain days of the month, I'm going to be more extroverted mm -hmm. than others, right? And depending on other situations I've got, on my mind and happening in my life, I'll have more space and more capacity for other people and those sorts mm. of things. But I think, yeah, a big part of a big part of that helping myself get over that guilt feeling is just really reminding myself that the world needs all kinds of different people. Mm. It needs all kinds of different expressions of creativity and friendship and empathy and generosity. And it doesn't all have to look a certain way, mm. you know? And so long as for me, so long as I'm showing up for people in a way that feels in integrity and that is actually helpful and is actually, you know, honoring of them, then it doesn't matter what that looks like, mm. if that makes sense. Mm. You know, yeah, makes there's a big sense. difference between me kind of between me just kind of living this completely self-seeking, selfish life of like my needs and my pleasure above all mm -hmm. else. <laughs> 
and me like doing the right thing on a daily basis, but mm. knowing that doing the right thing can also come with boundaries around what's possible for me and what's comfortable for me yes. and what I have available like on any given day, you know? Mm. Yeah. I mean, that's so good. There's so many pieces of that, that I feel like are the exact permission slip somebody needs to realize that we can choose to show up in a way that feels authentic and maybe doesn't fit a certain mold or doesn't align with somebody else's viewpoint of the right way to be. But Mm. I I think one of the things that I've really learned on the other side of alcohol is, and my friend Victoria Tower uses this quote, she says, I am not needless. And, And for me, it was always giving to other people and doing what other people wanted with alcohol or with with how I was showing up in the world and I was numbing it down with alcohol and really understanding that there's actually a different way to be that is more whole and more full. I mean, you're just mm. blowing my mind over yes. here writing, writing notes <laughs> all left and right. <laughs> it's so true though. It's so true. <laughs> so I know you are currently writing a book and it is not about sobriety or sober curiosity at all. How has that been it's to not. change kind of what you're doing? Well, you know, it's very interesting. I started this conversation by saying I've been like a a journalist and reporter and kind Mm. of cultural commentator, I suppose, for like 23 years at Uh this point. Sober Curious is one of many, 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 many subjects that I've Mm. written on and like investigated over the years. You know, I did have a big, a big um, platform called The Numinous, and I had a book that came out with that, which was all about sort of modern spirituality. So that was something, and I had a a, book on that. I've done two Sober Curious books now. but I suppose, yeah, I really, I, I felt ready to dive into a new subject, mm. you know? And also there are so many, because this has taken off in the way that it has, there are so many people for, for people to come to, yes, to hear about being sober curious. And like there's yes. a whole field now of kind of literature, not that there wasn't literature before sober curious came along, but there's so much literature, yes. there's so many podcasts, there's different treatment programs if that's what people need I feel like wow there's so much there and there's so much richness and it's been amazing to be part of that and Mm. I'm curious about other things too you know (laughs) so I love yeah it's felt it's felt great to do two it was great so my follow-up to Sober Curious was the Sober Curious Reset which I'm really happy I did because it's a very very practical tool that people can actually use it's like a daily workbook that takes you through 100 days of not drinking Mm that people can use to really kind of apply all the sober curious principles to their life. Mm -hmm. So that just, it just feels like my offering there is, is complete in a way. And I still have my podcast. And of course I'm still leading retreats. I have a retreat coming up in July, but um, I I will still be active in the sober curious space, but yeah, I've got a curious mind. Mm. I want to write books about all kinds of different subjects. But I suppose if anything, if anything links the themes of the books that I've written and the subjects I'm interested in. I am very interested in um, what are the things that we take as a given, Hmm. which we don't question. Hmm. And I guess that comes back to my innate curiosity. Hmm. Why don't we, why don't we question this? Yeah. Why don't we question this thing? Right. You know? And I love this idea of your offering being complete. We, we don't have to continue giving of ourselves to something that has been complete. And one of the things that you wrote that really stuck out to me, and I have to ask you, you said something about this book asked you to write it, this next book that you're writing. And Um, I am a big believer um, in this idea of big magic and Elizabeth Gilbert's concept of like ideas coming to us. And, And Sober Stories was very much an idea that asked me to birth it. So Tell me about like how the creative process goes for you and how, if alcohol has had any part in that. I'm curious, did I write that on my newsletter? Do you get my personal newsletter? I think it's on your Instagram, Instagram, but I do get your newsletter too. Okay. I mean, for me, and maybe this is part of my INFJ-ness, like I'm very, um, I guess I really have a strong intuition and I, ideas just find they mm-hmm. they just find me I did yeah. does feel like a tap on a shoulder with like yeah. this it's not so much a tap on a shoulder it's it, it it I don't know it's such an overused term but it does feel like something just downloads into my brain mm-hmm. and it's like this mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. um it was like that with deciding to do an event around being sober curious um it was definitely like that with the platform the numinous and it's been like that with the 
features that I've written for magazines and newspapers throughout the course mm. of my career. This thing, this thing. I do read, I read a lot. And I think my sensitivity, actually, um, I'm very sensitive and quick to sort of pick up on shifts in the culture and just shifts mm. in the way things are being spoken about. And I get very kind of like excited about those mm. shifts and where they're taking us, where they've come from and where they're taking us. And so that's, um, yeah, I think that's a function of my empathy, actually. I mm. think I can feel the public mood. Yes. Just moments ahead of mm. everyone else feeling it kind mm. of thing. No, I <laughs> you know, think it's that like that's... I can just sense, it's almost like I can sense a change in the weather and it's like, that's taking us here. And it, and the idea comes as a, and this is what we, we need to talk about. This mm. is what we need to question if we're going here kind of mm. thing. I think that's, uh, that is also how I experience ideas. They, they very much, as cliche as it, it sounds, feels like a download. And I'm one of those people who has many, many downloads and I don't execute on very many of them. So for the longest time, it made me feel very flaky to, to have all of these ideas, to have all these thoughts and then only execute on certain ones. And, and I've really since learned to tap into that intuition and to realize like I have discernment. I have discernment about which idea or the right ideas for me to steer forward. And, and I think for me, alcohol was always something that blunted my attunement to that, my ability mm. to actually listen to that intuition and that discernment and say, this is mm. the right next step or to trust myself. And I find so many creatives in this space are just are, are, are completely untethered. Uh, not That's not the word I'm looking for. Are completely like... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like they're, they're just so expansive after they remove alcohol because they're not blocking that intuition anymore. It's suddenly flowing mm. and it's suddenly freeing. So I love that mm. phrasing of this book asked you to write it. <laughs> yeah. We're running out of but time. But it's very interesting. I just, one thing I think you, I was actually, when you said, oh, it makes me feel flaky not to execute on all my ideas. I was thinking, no, that is discerning mm. because if I've learned anything, it's possible to have too many projects yeah. on the go. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> you asked me, how am I feeling about this yeah. new book coming out? I'm feeling kind of really excited and really excited to get into promo. But of course, my publisher's like, so you're going to start a new movement then? And I'm like, but wait, there's a movement here. There's a movement here. Like, how many movements is one woman supposed to be for, like, keeping spinning? Yeah. Do you I've know gotta, what I mean? You've got to catch them all. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> Just, I'm, I'm, I'm actively trying to practice discernment too. Yes. Well, I, I think that that is one of the gifts of a multi-passionate person is to be able to have many different gifts. And it sounds like you have a really good support team to help you bring those gifts to life. The last question I ask every podcast, and I may or may not know the answer to this for you. If your story were to be written and it was a book, what would it be titled and why? You can take a moment oh. to think about it. My story. Yeah. I'm going to leave that open-ended. Well, my new book is called Women Without Kids. Mm. So it might just be Woman Without Kids. <laughs> because actually there's so much about my mm. story. Yeah. This story, my past story, my historical story that has meant that I'm a woman without kids in this life. Mm. Mm. And that's all stuff that I unpack in the new book. So mm. yeah, it's funny for an author to answer that. Like, I feel like my, all of my books have been so personal. <laughs> my first book was called Material Girl, Mystical World, which was very much where I was at yeah. and who I was at that moment in my life. So, so be curious, woman without kids. So we'll yeah, different, different chapters <laughs> of a larger exactly. anthology. Exactly. Well, I know you have a lot of irons in the fire right now. So I know that folks listening to this are going to want to connect with you. Can you tell us about your retreat, about your book, about all of the ways that they can absorb your, your glory these days? So the Sober Curious Summer Retreat is at the Omega Institute in upstate New York. It's happening over the weekend of July 15th through 17th. It's just two days deep dive into what I have kind of what I believe are the really important pieces to look at and unpack mm. in terms of making a sustainable shift in your drinking going forwards. Mm -hmm. um, and the new book is called Women Without Kids. That's not out until March next year. And I've kind of been very much in create, creation 
mode, behind the mm. scenes mode. I'm just working on my final edits of the book now. And so I've been quite kind of off social media and my newsletter hasn't been going out very regularly, but I will be back out there. I've got a new season of the Sober Curious podcast launching in mid-June, which is in a couple of weeks. So yeah, I'll be back on Instagram <laughs> at Ruby Warrington. Not exactly my comfort my comfort zone, but I'll be back there soon um, talking about all these things. And people can also sign up for my personal newsletter there. Um, and I mentioned at the beginning that I work as a, a manuscript coach mm. and a book doula. I love that work so much. Mm. Um, and people can learn more about that on my website, rubywarrington.com. Amazing. We have a lot of people writing books that that visit this podcast. So I'm certain myself, per, perhaps included, that we'll seek your guidance <laughs> on that. But Ruby, thank you so much for your time and for your story and just kind of giving us a behind the scenes look at how this sober curious movement that so many people now just accept as part of our culture and what we're talking about really began before we were ever talking about this conversation. I appreciate your time today. Thanks for having me.